We have with us today Lance Christensen, who is a candidate for a state superintendent of public instruction. Lance is vice president of education policy and government relations at the California Policy Center. It's a conservative think tank. We extended the same invitation to state superintendent Tony Thurman, who's also running as an incumbent. We gave his campaign a two week window to have a Zoom meeting with us. The campaign said that would not be possible. Nonetheless, Lance Christensen, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Lance, why are you running and what would be your top priority? I, as you said, am a father of five kids, all of which have been in the public school system the entire time they've been in uh, in public schools. My oldest graduating this last year. For two of the years that we were in the pandemic, my wife homeschooled them through an online charter, still a public school. So we've had the opportunity to see several facets of education policy in California. We really love the state. My kids are seventh generation Californians. Their great, great, great grandparents settled in Sacramento years ago, leaving the Prussians far behind. And what we have now come upon in California is a Prussian system they tried to leave years ago where we put these kids on the proverbial conveyor belt in a warehouse in kindergarten and send them through the system. And it's not working. It's not working for a lot of people. EdSource has done a tremendous job in walking through all of the problems and concerns on our literacy rates, on mathematics, uh, science education, um, other curricula that we have. And so when I worked in the legislature, I actually spent a good number of years as a chief of staff to then State Senator John Morloff from Orange County, who was the only CP in the legislature. He was also the vice chair of the subcommittee on education spending. So I got a firsthand look at every single dollar that went through the state budget process for five years. Um, I had also spent time at the Department of Finance, so I know how the, the sausage is made, for, you know, and, and have watched the whole system. And what I found is that California went from being the premier education system in the world where people brought their kids from near and far to have them educated in California to where we're losing students in the hundreds of thousands every year to other places. And I thought that's a complete travesty, especially with how much money and resources and effort we're putting into our education. And so last year, I, as you mentioned, I was one of the principal architects of the School Choice Initiative, which would have built these education savings accounts using general fund dollars to provide opportunities for kids to get an education outside of their neighborhood school. Um, parents shouldn't just have the option to take their kid to any school. They should have the resources as well. I think that that's what is um, basically stated or implied in the state constitution, in Article 9, that every child has access to a free public education. It doesn't mean they have to go to a specific government school. And so we worked on that, weren't able to get it on there. And I thought, what other thing could I do that would advance the ball on education reform? And looking around, I saw the superintendent of public instruction basically not doing his job and falling behind on a lot of measures to get our kids back into school and to make sure that their, that their education was being attended to. And so I felt like he needed somebody, an opponent that would actually challenge him on the ideas. Um, he and I both made it through the primary. He got less than 46%. So it meant that he had to go to the, to the general um, the unions have spent a lot of money in, on his behalf, millions of dollars, and um, I've been able to get this far with very few resources, but with a lot of parental help. And so if I'm elected, the idea is to add parents back into the education equation and make sure that their voices are heard, to, that they're not the last person to be consulted on major decisions. And uh, I have a whole series of things I'd like to do, which we can suss out if you want, or I can tell you well, about them. If you can, Lance, talk a little bit about a couple specific priorities that you had have in mind if you if you took over. Sure, I can take three really quick. Uh, one is I would hire a chief parent advocate as my uh, deputy superintendent, somebody who'd be attuned to the needs and a liaison with parents who feel really frustrated and left out of the whole process. It doesn't mean that they would have to deal with all of the parents of six million kids, but right now, most parents are the last to be consulted on issues of discipline, school safety, curricula. And I think that's a travesty. And especially when you have kids who have special needs or other issues. I have a daughter with an IEP. Um, it's really painful sometimes to go through that process and get her the resources she needs so she can have her speech therapy and, and other things to improve as a student. 
Uh, number two is I think it's time to have a kids first audit of our state education budget of the Department of Education and of the education code. Um, all three of those places are wrought with uh, bloated bureaucracies, with programs that were built decades ago that don't apply today, that are often counterintuitive and are just simply not workable anymore. And if I really believe, which I do, that local governments, the school boards in our 944 school districts and 58 county boards of education are the key decision makers, I would like to see as much of that decision making down at the lower level where they can be held responsible and accountable for the, the actions they make. And then I think it's time to have, have that conversation. I think either going around the state and meeting with superintendents and school board trustees and, and other administrators and teachers to find out what's working, what's not working in their local districts, and to have maybe a confab or a forum up in Sacramento where we can talk about the, the related authorities and, and needs and obligations of both the state bureaucracy in terms of the Department of Education and Board of Education, as well as the local districts out there. And I think it's a time to have that conversation. We did it in the 1960s with our higher education, um, where we did uh, you know, a really big plan to, to make sure that we were focused in on our community colleges, our CSUs and our UCs. Maybe it's time to have a master plan for K through 12 education this next year. When you mention you sort of become a parent ombudsman uh, is sort of one way of, I guess, phrasing it. Sure. And, and yet um, parents do have um, their local school boards they can attend. They have their local site councils. They have the under the local control funding formula, the, the local control and accountability plan in which they can have some input if they want to get involved. Many parents don't get involved. Um, what is it that, uh, what is it that we're missing here as far as parent involvement? Well, I think the current superintendent understands that parents have been involved too. When I announced this plan back in April, he quickly formed a parent advisory council um, that would be comprised of, uh, you know, parents throughout the state and he would pay them to advise them on how to interact with parents. I think simply having somebody who's an a listening ear and available to those kinds of issues is more important than creating some massive council that never meets. Um, I also think too that those things you outlined are true on a local level and I've participated in many of them. I was on my local school district's oversight committee for finances and transportation facilities issues. I did that for a few years as their assistant president uh, of that com committee. It was really instructive in terms of of education dollars spent, busing, you know, closing and shutting down schools. Um, I've been a vice president of a booster club so for several years. And so I've written the checks to make sure we have, you know, music, music programs and sport programs and buses and locker rooms and all kind of stuff. I think the, the disconnect is when you have a lot of that participation at the local level and then the superintendent or the board says, well, we're sorry, the state won't allow us to do X, Y, or Z because... And I think if there's a conduit to the superintendent through a parent um, advocate, I think that, that those kinds of lines could be broken or, or accentuated, depending on which, what needs to happen, to make sure that the voices are heard, not just at the local level, but that if there's a continuity of conversation between the, the state and the locals. Well, the local control funding formula was passed um, nearly a decade ago, and the intent was to restore control to the local, bring local control, as it said, as well as distribute money more equitably or more uh, distribute money towards those with higher needs and uh, recognize that the system is inequitable. What's, is it failing? What, what, uh, what would you do about that law? I think, yeah, go ahead. I think the intent is, is right. Governor Brown, I was in the legislature as a staffer when the legislature moved forward on this at, at Governor Brown's request. And the idea was pretty simple to really pull away a lot of the categoricals and mandates that, that, uh, need capped, uh, districts and really uh, restricted them from doing a lot of things with their monies. Um, we had pigeonholed a whole bunch of resources and funds because of certain desires of the legislature. And so taking those restraints off was supposed to open it up and give more flexibility. I think in, in practice, it's not been as successful as it was applied in theory. And if, if you talk to superintendents, which I have, I've talked to dozens of superintendents 
they get really frustrated about the reporting requirements and the increased requirements that continue to come from the legislature. It's almost like the legislature forgot that we passed, you know, the local control funding formula and, and have the LCAPs and everything else. I, I think that they don't quite understand how that works. Um, and we're about to see Proposition 28 get on the ballot. If we have another uh, ballot box budget item come out, that will further constrain their ability to have flexibility in their budgets. And so we've got to have a conversation about what that looks like uh, at a local and state level. And I think peeling back some of the bureaucratic stops at the Department of Education would be a huge assist. A lot of what the superintendents and school boards are waiting for at the state level should be ministerial action, should be easily approved and moved on if it's federal funds or other kinds of things that are important to them that have to go through the state. We should simplify that process as much as possible. Part of the uh, job of superintendent is using a bully pulpit, such as you are doing today. Um, but the biggest job is probably to run the Department of Education with its 1,500 employees. The last four superintendents have come out of a legislature with really no experience running a big organization. Um, why would you be better, given your background, why would you be better able to handle the administrative and organizational responsibilities and, and, and what isn't it doing that it should be doing? Well, I think I've run a couple of organizations or been the top part of organizations that have a, a decent overhead and an amount of people, not thousands of people, obviously. Um, but I think coming in and having a real clear vision of what the Department of Education should be doing. Right now, it's a grab all for every faddish policy that the last four superintendents have had. So go through and you can track all the different offices that they've created for these different, you know, fun projects. But I don't know where their legal citations and authorities come from. At the Department of Finance, we had to justify every dollar that we sent to department land. I'm sure that's happened at some level with the Department of Finance, but because the superintendent's his own constitutional authority, there's probably a lot of stuff that just has been held over for no reason. So again, having a kid's first audit or a forensic audit of some sort of what's actually going on, where are those dollars coming from and how are they approved, I think would be a first major step. Yeah, I think a second piece to that is we have to make sure that whatever is there is not blocking the locals from getting their job done. And if we can justify having a program at the state that that the, that the locals want that makes sense for them, let's do it. But if the locals come back and say, hey, could you remove this barrier? I think I'd be very active. Again, I worked at the Department of Finance. I know how a BCP or a budget change proposal is written. I know how to go forward and say, let's restructure this in a way that makes sense so that we modify and streamline our bureaucratic you know, presence in Sacramento. Well, some of it, I think, Lance, is that it comes with accountability. You say, uh, let the locals control, but part of it is the legislature and the federal government says, we give you money. Let's make sure we're using it, at least with the way that we intended, if not uh, wisely. And part of it's, you know, where do you find a balance between the accountability uh, for spending and locals simply doing whatever they want to do? Well, I think, again, local school boards are elected. There's the accountability. It's the people at the local level. Some people say, well, if it's state money, then we should you know, have some at the top. Well, you do. You have a superintendent, but really the constitutional authorities are a light touch on that, right? They really want to let the locals have the amount of discretion and approval process as possible. That's why most of these school boards, I don't think, or the trustees fully understand or grasp how much authority they have. They're quick to blame Sacramento for a lot of things or say, hey, we would do this, but for Sacramento. So I'm saying get a lot of those constrictions or restrictions out of the way, make them accountable. And then for the things that really have to happen at the state level that the legislature said, yes, we want the superintendent or we want the Department of Education to do, then that's fine. We can go that process, but it doesn't require thousands of employees to do that. During the, um, I think a lot of parent dissatisfaction, I'm sure you're hearing it as you go around, is because of the way schools were closed during COVID. And so if there's another resurgence of COVID, how should the state and districts respond to ensure the safety of children and staff? I think, first of all, have a plan and stick to it. Uh, from what I can tell, there was no plan. And there was no ability to actually uh, follow any protocol that had been established before 2019 or 20. 
I think that's one thing. So it might be that we have a really comprehensive look. And then let's actually look at the science, what happened. Um, I think the narrative for a lot of what was happening during COVID is, is falling apart. Most of these kids were not impacted by COVID. Now, adults were, and there were a, a number of people where terrible things happened and, and there were lives lost, no doubt. But let's make sure that when we put um, a lot of the needs of the schools in front of these kids and they're expected to open their classes back up, but they don't, or they're the last, or this last state in the nation to do so, uh, something went wrong there. And I would expect that we would have to have a better conversation about what our process should be. And again, uh, as a superintendent of public instruction, I'm not over the Department of Public Health and, and I don't have extraordinary powers to shut or open things up. But I think if you have somebody going out there really looking independently at the science and saying, hey, this is what's happening. This is how we can protect our students and our teachers and our administrators and our school sites, but also not lose kids to anxiety, depression, and suicide outside. We forget there were a lot of impacts from keeping kids away from uh, these coming of age experiences for some of them, the top years of their life. My oldest who graduated high school barely had a high school experience, barely. The last few months of his senior year and a little bit of his freshman year, that's it. So I think, you know, shame on us that we didn't allow for these kids to have the kind of experiences they could and done safely like a lot of other, other states did. So let's find other states what their best practices was were and let's copy those. Let's find a, a plan to go forward in the future. But I think shutting down schools and locking kids behind a Zoom uh, screen is probably the last thing we should ever do again. Yeah, you brought up the issue of, of mental health um, and wellness among children, particularly the impacts of the pandemic. So here we are today and we have that. What would you do to respond to it? I think normalcy is the first thing. Um, if there are still schools that are holding programs back or kids out or uh, teachers down, I, I get phone calls from teachers in LAUSD that are telling me that their, their programs are still being sidelined. Um, and some of it has to do with pressures from the county, which are different than the pressures from the state. Um, there's got to be some amount of accountability and make sure we get these kids into some sort of normal process. The other one, too, is... We've, I think we need to bring down the fear level a little bit. Uh, there was a lot of unknowns in 2020, but we've learned a lot since. We've learned a tremendous uh, amount just in the last six months. I think it's time to stop uh, pushing a lot of the fear narrative and let parents know that their kids are safe when they go to school, that, that schools are taking the necessary precautions to make sure there's uh, some amount of security as well and discipline, but that, that this virus is not going to kill their kids. A lot of people just simply don't understand what's what was the real science and what is the narrative that goes out there. And most schools have done a great job about keeping their kids safe. You have been uh, critical of the California Teachers Association in relation to the closure of schools, but for other reasons, why why is that? Well, uh, what's the, the issue with is, the CTA? The list is long. Uh, State of California is somewhere around three hundred nineteen thousand public school teachers most of which are incredible people. I taught fourth grade in Denver, Colorado for a short amount of time. Um, and I learned that most of these teachers are wonderful human beings who want to do the right thing. They just want to teach kids. But the teachers union seems to protect the worst, the loudest, and the angriest teachers among them. Um, and as a matter of fact, it's very difficult for a teacher to be fired, especially those who do grievous things. Um, I watched and have watched as a lot of school districts uh, try to wrestle with the union when they have to negotiate contracts. I mean, Sac City Unified this April was one example where they wanted to use the powers and, and the issues around COVID to get a pay increase. When as a matter of fact, we looked at the numbers, they were actually the highest paid teachers of all the school districts in the surrounding area. So I think they leverage their uh, weight a lot. But the fact that these teachers, most of them who don't have to belong to the union are not legally obligated to belong to the union to have their job teaching when they're spending nearly a thousand dollars a year, that's close, what, approximately $300 million a year, the CTA and their affiliates get every year to lobby against the issues of parents and, and children. Um, they have a job to do is to protect their interests. I get that, but it's almost like the parasite is eating the host. I'm happy to negotiate with teachers. I think we should provide them with the protections they deserve. There are other states that do this very well. We shouldn't use our children as hostages or pawns. 
and we shouldn't use them as um, negotiating tools when we want greater salary and cutting down their class uh, time room instruction. Speaking of teachers, we're facing a teacher shortage, particularly in rural areas, some urban districts, and in and in certain hard to uh, hard to hire areas such as STEM and special education and bilingual teachers. The state has invested a lot of money to try and attract teachers to the classroom. What would you do to make it a more attractive position and to um, retain teachers as well? I think this is a big discussion we should have as a state. The superintendent sits on the Commission for Teacher Credentialing. Um, Over the last four years, he could have done something to improve that situation to hold poor teachers accountable so that we can actually get rid of some of the the teachers that don't belong in the classroom. Um, I think one of it is when you get really good professionals who want to go and teach, they don't want to be cut with or caught in the mix with those that really aren't very functional or willing to put in the time. Um, When I was in the classroom in fourth grade in Denver, Colorado, there were teachers who were exceptional and wonderful people. And there was, there were some very poor teachers too. And yet they were all basically dealt with the same amount of, you know, uh, of vim and vigor. Uh, I think that's a problem. I think too, recruitment of teachers needs to change. The old model we have of sending kids um, to college, to go to, to teacher school, to do this multi-year credentialing process. I think it weeds out a lot of really um, good people that want a faster process. Um, I don't know why it takes so long to be teacher or credentialed as a teacher. There are other states that do this much quicker. I also think we should have access to our retired and, and older, more mature workers who decided they don't want to be doctors or engineers or accountants or, you know, uh, any number of things and decide they want to go and, and take the knowledge they've learned over years back into the classroom. They don't need the money. They're not going there to make another paycheck. They're going because they don't want to sit in retirement and be bored all day. Why not give a credential faster to these people, develop a small program that takes a few weeks to develop lesson plans and curricula and send them off to the world. I mean, if you had a world-class physician or athlete, uh, you know, teaching your, your physiology class, can you imagine how excited not only other teachers would be to be in that school with you, but also that students would want to come and be in your public school? I think there's ways to do this. LA has magnet schools that do this with Hollywood. I think we can replicate it throughout the state, but that requires some innovation in our teacher credentialing process. And also we need to address uh, the, 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 uh, the teacher tenure laws as well. I, I think those are untenable and, and don't allow us to get a full accurate um, review of teachers that are good and, and not good and, and to make decisions accordingly. I mean, you're not saying that uh, what we have now is a, a credentialing period, which usually takes at least... Um, a year, and a year, year and a half, you're saying that should be reduced to just a couple of weeks before someone takes charge of a classroom? I think if you're a retired person who's been in the business a while, I don't see any reason why you need more than a couple of weeks to do something like that. If you're coming into the system brand new and this is your you know, first foray into teaching, I don't have a problem with some sort of process, but I don't think that it necessarily has to be the same for everybody. If you can show competency in what you do, Let's get you in the classroom as fast as possible. So the state has invested billions of dollars in, because we've had a record uh, funding in much of it in part-time uh, and one-time money for uh, after-school programs and summer programs and for low-income districts and to establish thousands of community schools to allow the schools to decide how to invest in health counseling academic advancement, sort of approaching the whole child. Is this, are these wise investments, Lance, and and do you have concerns about them? I have major concerns about them. I think that taking responsibility over every aspect of the child's life away from the parent is concerning. It's problematic. I understand there are some communities where it's difficult to find health care or to find the kind of mental health facilities that are appropriate for the kids. Um, I live in a rural commu- commu- uh, community, excuse me. It's a, it's a 20 minute drive to almost anything that, that, you know, represents a civilization, um, except for a few gas stations and a, and a you know, pizza joint. Uh, I get what it means to have, um, access to those kinds of services. I think there are better ways you can do it. And I've dealt with a lot of charities and nonprofits that do these things very well. I don't know that it needs to be the school job. It's almost like mission creep. 
Our kids can't read. So why are we adding all these other programs to the mix? And EdSource has been one of the most amazing resources on identifying the, the, the broken parts of our literacy and math programs in the state. Let's focus on those things first. And if there are ways we could partner with other, you know, charitable nonprofits or other groups that maybe through the county, I don't have a problem with that. I don't think it's the focus or should be the priority of the schools. Yeah, by the way, actually, the goal of community schools actually is to empower parents as well. That's what they say. That's yeah. not what it does, though. I mean, you, and again, I've been in politics and, and uh, leg- the legislature long enough to know they can say something. It's really cute, but it doesn't match reality. I mean, it's like the lottery money. Let's let's get all these monies to schools. And I have people every stop I go to. Where's the lottery money from? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a lot of programs that are well intended that the legislature gets really cute at naming. I've been in those discussions before, but the reality is this doesn't empower parents. It actually takes the responsibility away. Well, I guess for a large part, we'll have to wait and see because the money's just rolling out. But uh, that is certainly written into the law and the intent. Um, as you, you say, we'll have to see if, in fact, that that is what happens. You mentioned um, literacy and and um, and reading how the state is not um, producing readers. It, it, most of the majority of, at least on the third grade test, which is late to find out if one is a reader or not, uh, only half of the people are passing the Smarter Balance reading test. Um, is this a, isn't this not a case of local control in which um, maybe the state needs to play a bigger role in a literacy policy because it's not happening at the state at the local level in which we really have very little involvement in kindergarten, first and second grade. Um, what would you do to increase literacy and in, in as critical as that is, Lance? I think this is another case where the locals blame the state and the state blames the locals. Um, I really do believe that it's at the local level where you get these programs running. It's my understanding the state does have a plan and has had a plan for a while. They haven't done anything with it. Um, And so I don't know what creating another plan would do, especially if you're not willing to implement that plan. I also understand, too, that some of this is just not based on science. Um, We've really avoided a lot of the phonics education in California. We've not given our young teachers the tools necessary to improve their reading pedagogy and instruction. Um, for those school districts that do literacy well, they really involve the parents. And as a father of five kids, I know that reading starts in the home. If you're not reading with your kid every single day, you're missing opportunities and no teacher in the world is gonna make up for that. Um, so I think that there's gotta be more honest communication with parents too some sort of obligation responsibility to make sure that if you don't feel um, confident in what you're doing with your kids, it doesn't take much than just sitting down and reading with them. Um, again, there are kids with learning disabilities and needs. I have a daughter who struggle with this stuff. We know that we can get resources that can focus on the issues where there are, there are holes, but that means that we have to, again, it's the school and the classroom that ultimately is going to be the one to deliver these things. In a state of 5.9 to 6 million kids in the public school system, I don't know what another state program looks like because the training at the top isn't happening. And then by the time it's like playing phone, by the time the message gets down to the teacher, uh, unless it's delivered well and effectively and regularly, again, I've I've done a lot of training programs in the nonprofit world, a lot. If you can't get that program from the top to the bottom communicated very well or effectively, and be consistent in it, it will never happen. So again, I think ultimately it is down to the local districts and the, and the principals and the school teachers to make sure this works, but communicating with the parents that they have to be reading with their kids all the time. And you're right, cap- capturing is said third grade is far too late. It's far too late. We have to hit them a lot earlier than third grade. The state is requiring districts to, uh, to uh, include as a graduation requirement, ethnic studies by 29th year 2029 Um, And you've been critical of ethnic studies often. Is, is the criticism over teaching it at all or how it should be taught? And, and what's, what's, what's your view of ethnic studies? Well, I think what ethnic studies in, again, in intention versus reality are two different things. So when you have a state policy, when they were passing this earlier on, remember the ethnic studies proposals they had were anti-Semitic and were opposed by the very progressive Jewish legislative caucus. 
You also have a, a, a amount of people within the Asian Pacific Islander um, communities who also feel like this doesn't address their issues. I am not opposed to teaching the warts, scars, and bruises of history. We should absolutely do this. Our country, United States, and California has been involved in a lot of atrocious things, whether it's stealing uh, land from the local people, slavery, indentured servitude of the Chinese in California, or putting Japanese in concentration camps. Those are all incredibly terrible things, and those are just a small to the iceberg. But when we teach these things in school, it, had, it has to be taught in, in perspective and context. I think part of the problem is the way that ed, the ethnic studies has been sold is that we're going to go out and make sure that we focus on these groups that have been underrepresented. Well, California is a mixing pot of a lot of different ethnicities, races, religions, and backgrounds. I don't know how you can thoroughly go through and cover all those gaps, except for the ones that are chosen by the legislature or the preferred groups. So that's one part of the problem. The other part is then you turn it over to a teacher who may not be very sympathetic to whatever groups they're trying to teach about. Uh, that can be problematic in the way that they might skip over or accentuate things or maybe cause guilt to students, which they don't need to. A lot of kids already feel bad enough for who they are right now. They don't need to go through a guilt trip because somebody years ago who shared the same language or skin color as they did, did something bad. Um, that kind of stuff shouldn't be taught in schools. Um, it should be avoided. And if parents really want these kinds of things taught, they can also teach in their homes too. But sending kids off to school to learn history, it needs to be in full context. I have no problem talking about the, the terrible parts of history. Let's not, though, focus on just those simple things and forget also the great things that happen in California history. Yeah, you, you've gone farther, at least what I've read from what you said, and you've talked about uh, indoctrination uh, occurring in the schools. Could you give us an example? I, I mean, we've sure, seen Gabriel a lot of Guy. rhetoric nationally. Go, and, go ahead. Yeah, and Gabriel Guy at Natomas Unified, he said in his AP government class that he had 180 days to turn kids into uh, radical revolutionaries. That's not his job. And when we were, when we were comparing uh, AP test scores of his class to other you know, people out there, other classes, that he usually scored far lower, but it took parents and you know, an undercover camera operation to expose this. But surprise, surprise, this isn't happening just in that classroom. There are a lot of classrooms where this is happening. My oldest son had an experience where he went into his high school English class and the teacher on the syllabus had a, a line that said, my top priority is to make you social justice warriors. It's an English class. This happened to us personally as a family. This is not some story you heard about. That's not his business. His business is to make sure that he's teaching English, critical thinking, writing, analysis. Um, I, 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 the examples could go on and on and on. If you talk to any parent who's been at their school and has to deal with some radical teacher in the classroom, it's very likely there's some sort of indoctrination um, or propaganda going on. And it doesn't take long to find it. That doesn't mean that all teachers are doing it. That doesn't mean that teachers that talk about difficult things are indoctrina uh, indoctrinators. I remember in my AP US history class in Denver, Colorado as a young kid, I had no idea what my politics and my AP US history class or teacher were, none. Because he taught things fairly and he never brought up his own personal life. When teachers feel like they've got to be advocates instead and activists instead of teaching things, that's where we have a problem. You've endorsed dozens of school board candidates, which I think is a little unusual for a uh, candidate for. I think we're up to 150 now. Okay. Uh, what are the criteria that you've used uh, in endorsing these candidates? The two main criteria are that they're for parent, parent rights, parental rights within their, their kids' education, and, and two, that they're open to. Uh, competition with schools, uh, making sure that schools are doing the right thing within their communities. We go through a few other things too. We want to make sure they're respecting the community, that they have good relationships, that they've been working hard, that they put forward the effort to actually get out and make a difference. So we don't we don't approve or uh, endorse everybody who asks, but we endorse those that we really think will make a difference going forward in the new school board. We really think that parents, when they're active, involved, and listened to that they don't go to school board meetings and riot and yell and, and scream at people. They need to be heard. And if they're heard, I think the dial goes down several notches within the school districts. Um, 
The campaign funding so far has been one-sided. It's I think you've raised about 112,000. Tony Thurman has raised 2.3 million plus their independent expenditures from the California Teachers Association on his behalf of at least several million dollars. Um, is this um, in, in, is this an indication of the problems you're talking about, or is it that an indication that you're just sort of out of sync with voters? which we'll find out in, in about a month, but nope. how would you interpret that? We will find out very soon, won't we? But what I'm finding out is that a lot of teachers are very upset with their union. Uh, they don't approve their union. They're paying the dues as hush money. They're involved because they don't want to be bullied in classes, and the teachers' union are bullies in a lot of these classes. It, it's just a fact of the matter. And so the fact that he's received millions of dollars is indicative that he just wants to continue with the same failed policies that have got us the lowest literacy rates of the nation that have not advanced any of our test scores uh, on any other metric that you can think of. If the union were doing its job, we would have the best schools in the nation because we pour the most amount of money into the unions, but we don't have those. And the fact that they demanded to be shut down for much longer than any other state in the country, I think is indicative of what Tony Thurman would do. In fact, he told one of our board meetings that he would absolutely shut down schools again if we had a, a another pandemic like COVID-19. So I think that's problematic. Of course, he's going to raise millions of dollars from the teachers union because he, he's a wholly owned subsidiary of them. This is the problem. I'm running as a parent. A lot of my donations are $25, $50, and $100, most of them. Um, I've had a few large checks, but it's not because people are coming in uh, to sway the system. They just want to counterbalance what's been going on for decades. The teachers union has owned the superintendent of public instruction for generations. Uh, this has to stop. And I'm hoping that the voters will look at the incumbent and say, this man has done nothing to improve our education system in California. It's time to give somebody a different shot. Somebody who has the credentials, the capabilities, uh, and the leadership capabilities to make this happen. Wish we could uh, have had uh, Tony Thurman on to defend himself. We gave him that opportunity. So um, we'll let that stand. And I really appreciate your coming on today, Lance, and uh, telling us, sharing your views with our, with our readers. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Always the constant professional. Thank you.